Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Okay, so now having uh, described the you know very uh, very sophisticated uh, hardness methods, how the hardness measure methods or hardness measurement is useful in finding out something else. So hardness test an approximate measure of fracture toughness of ceramics. So the fracture toughness is measured by just measuring the hardness in ceramics. Okay, so you we will see in the later that you know ceramics exhibits very very poor ductility, right? And the fracture toughness of the ceramics are very very poor. But improving the fracture toughness in ceramics itself a technology, it's a huge technology and very important. We will see when we look at uh, in the fracture mechanics aspects of materials. So here, just by measuring the wicker's hardness, which makes the you know pyramid impression like this, the surface will have this uh, a square type this, and what is shown in the rose color is uh, the cracks which just uh, emanates from the sharp edge, corners of the inductor. So assume that this is the ceramic material and this is the wicker's hardness measurement and the cracks develops like this. So secondary cracks developed during the hardness testing can be used to assess the fracture toughness of brittle materials. Okay. So illustrated here is a schematic of such secondary cracks emanating from the diamond pyramid blender used in a Vickers hardness test. So this is what it is. So these this distance is 2A and the end to end two crack ends are measured as 2D prime. The indentation length is 2A, basically a diagonal length here. Secondary crack emanate from the indentation corners and have the length of 2D prime and measured on the sample surface. Correlation of the lengths of indentation cracks with measured values of K1 C indicate that ceramic fracture toughness values correlate with this length as K1 C. K1 C is equal to alpha naught into E by H to the power half into p by d to the power 3 by 2 where e is the material modulus h is h its hardness p the indentation load and 2 d prime the secondary crack length the value of toughness is expressed in mega newton per meter to the power 3 by 2 if the constant alpha naught is taken as 0 0.016 and the other terms in the equations are in SI units. The value of alpha naught is accurate to about 25% as determined by the correlation of indentation fracture toughnesses with those obtained through more fundamental means. You see, it is quite interesting, right? So I said that knowing the fracture toughness of ceramics is very important and it is very uh, technologically also very important. So measuring this, uh, you know, fracture toughness just by means of hardness test is also very handy. Okay, though it gives some, you know, some not very accurate but approximate value it gives. Nevertheless, it gives an idea about the fracture toughness. Okay, so this is another uh, interesting uh, aspect of measuring hardness in ceramics. Now. We will just uh, move on to the next important uh, mechanical testing or tensile test. Before even getting into the, the results and the description of what kind of uh, data you will get, we will also look at the mechanics aspect of tensile test. Since we have spent a lot of time in mechanics aspect, so it is better to correlate then and there. That helps. So what is involved in a tensile test? A tensile test uh, normally conducted on a cylindrical bar or a plate um, with a specific geometry. We are not talking about that. We are simply taking a, a rectangular bar or a sheet in a 2D and then subject them to 
a tensile force like this and um, the area of the cross section is uh, A1 and um, the force, uh, the tensile force is F1 here. So the sigma 1 is F by A1. So that is what it is. So resolution of a tensile stress into a shear and a tensile stress on a plane rotated by an angle theta to the tensile axis. Okay. The shear force on this plane is equal to F sin theta and the tensile force is equal to F cos theta. So how do we understand this? So this is the uh, shear plane which is uh, 45 degree. This also you understand now. That is the plane where the maximum shear stress act. So all the crystals slip by, I mean deform by slip and it is in this plane. That, that those details and all you know now. So this is uh, axis, force axis. So this is uh, theta, 90 degree theta. So pass uh, 90 minus theta is uh, sin theta. So that is how it becomes F1 sin theta. So this is F1. So this is F1 times sin theta is becomes this shear force. That is what it is. So that sin theta comes from cos 90 minus theta. So sin. So F sin, F1 sin theta is the shear force. And then this one is a tensile force. So you, you just look at this direction and then take uh, the force which is coming, acting on this a plane is not just F1, but it is F1 times cos theta uh, is the magnitude of the uh, tensile force acting on this. So that is what it is here. So we, we have already, since we have already spent a lot of time on, you know, how to resolve this stress and all that. So I, this is the one good example application of your uh, knowledge in a simple tensile testing. The area of the rotated plane is equal to A1 by cos theta where A1 is a transverse cross-sectional area normal to the applied force such that the normal tensile stress sigma 1 is equal to F by A1. Okay. Thus, the resolved shear stress on the rotated plane is tau is equal to F by A1 times sin theta cos theta. The corresponding tensile stress is sigma is equal to sigma 1 cos squared theta. So, how do we get this? So, the shear stress is shear force by the shear uh, stress acting on the area. So, which is equal to F by A1 sin theta cos theta. Okay. So, you need to understand that uh, the, the rotated plane uh, is much larger than this. So, that means larger by what amount? Larger by 1 by cos theta. It is larger than by 1 by cos theta. So, so that is why it is written like that. So, this can be uh, written like this F by A1 is equal to sigma 1. That is the only principal stress in the tensile stress or uh, tensile uh, test, sorry, sigma 1. Okay. So, which can be rewritten like this 1 by 2 sigma 1 sin 2 theta. Why do we write in this form? Because we can represent this, the whole state of stress in a more circle, which is always plotted with a 2 theta. This solves procedure also we have seen. So, now we can see the application of that later. So, this is a shear stress and then uh, uh, tensile stress is F by A1 cos squared theta is equal to sigma 1 cos squared theta which can be rewritten like this 1 by 2 times sigma 1 into 1 plus cos 2 theta. Okay. So, this is in uh, trigonometric identities. So, we can now uh, plot this in a more circle to understand that concept again. Uh, this will again give an opportunity to recall what we have already learned. So, what is uh, shown here? It is, uh, as I told you, this is the only principal stress uh, in a tensile test is sigma 1. So, which is, uh, which will form a, so around this we will uh, make a circle. So, that becomes a diameter. Sigma 1 has become a diameter of a more circle. And then, so this is what is written here. A more circle representation of the stress state corresponding to the situation in the figure 1. Uniaxial tension is represented by the circle with the diameter equal to sigma 1. This is what I just said. 
the intercepts of the circle on the tensile stress axis are 0 and 1, sigma 1. So, this is 0 and sigma 1. This is the two intercepts of the circle. A plane rotated by the angle theta with respect to the plane of the principal stress has a shear stress acting on it as shown. So, here this is theta. So, in most circle we plot it as a 2 theta. So, 2 theta wherever it intersects it gives a corresponding tensile stress and a shear stress. So, so whatever we are now showing as a resolved shear stress and a tensile stress also can be obtained by simply plotting on the Mohr circle here. So, this is corresponding shear stress and this is corresponding uh, this is corresponding tensile stress. So, the maximum shear stress has a magnitude of uh, sigma 1 by 2 and it is found on the plane rotated 45 degree from the tensile axis. So, this also we know. So, that will come here. So, the 2 theta will become about 90. So, theta will become 45. So, that is also we know. So, the next one is uh, uh, what will happen to subject uh, the specimen by biaxial tension. Okay. Another simple interesting problem. Suppose a second principal component of the stress can be considered. Here the nominal uh, second stress is sigma 2 is equal to f by a2. So, here we are talking about this is sigma 1 and this is sigma 2 in this direction. So, uh, same figure, but then you see that uh, the, the stress resolution takes place here, which is uh, shown here. You can see that this is F2 because this direction and then this is uh, the, the normal force and the, uh, shear, the shear force and the normal force is given like this. So, here the uh, shear force is F2 cos theta and the normal force is uh, F2 sin theta, which is uh, already we have seen. But this stress reduces the shear stress on the rotated plane and also alters the tensile stress there. So, very important point. We are talking about a biaxial tension. So, this, the secondary principal component of the stress is going to reduce the shear stress, what is being already there in the uh, uniaxial tensile test. So, here the maximum shear, I mean the shear stress is given by the difference in the two principal stresses times the sin 2 theta. Okay. So, we can just uh, again we can uh, write the tensile stress which is equal to half time sigma 1 into 1 plus cos 2 theta plus half sigma 1 1 minus cos 2 theta. So, we can write it like this. So, this is a combination of two principal stresses plus the, the difference uh, in the uh, principal stresses times the cos 2 theta that is uh, your tensile stress. So, we can plot them again on the Mohr circle. Here what, what we are seeing, here we are talking about two principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2. The difference between the sigma 1 and sigma 2 forms the diameter of the Mohr circle. Okay, so that is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is this. So, so this is what is written. Circle has a diameter equal to the difference between the magnitude of the principal stresses. The intercepts of the circle along the tensile stress axis are sigma 2 and sigma 1. And here a plane rotated by an angle theta with respect to the original axis has the shear stress component illustrated. So, rest are the same. We know that. This is 2 theta, so this is uh, sigma and this is shear. The maximum shear stress again found on a plane rotated by 45 degree. However, in this case, the maximum shear is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2. This is important. There it was sigma 1 by 2 maximum, but here it is not sigma 1 by 2, it is rather sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2. So, this is uh, another. Uh, way of looking at this. Now, we will go to uh, engineering stress strain curve. Okay. So, normally in any uh, textbook, 
the engineering stress strain is illustrated like this. So, what is plotted here is the average stress versus conventional strain. So, you can see that uh, the average stress goes like this and reaches a maximum and it comes down. The stress used in this sustained curve is the average longitudinal stress in a tensile specimen. This is obtained by the load by the original area of cross section of the specimen. So, this is important. Whenever we talk about engineering stress, we divide the load by the original area of cross section. Okay. So, what are the descriptors here? So, we are we are showing something since this curve is uh, continuous. So, to find out the you know yield strength, there is something called offset yield strength is defined. We will see it, uh, how exactly we can do that. And there is something called uniform strain which goes up to the maximum and the strain to fracture up to the fracture point. And then you have offset yield strength, tensile strength and the fracture stress. So, so many uh, parameters are already I mean, uh, denoted on this uh, stress strain plot. So, we will we will thoroughly look at all of them one by one very slowly. Okay. So, the engineering stress is uh, represented by S yes, uh, in this textbook. So, I have just followed this uh, reference mostly for this section which is in data. The engineering stress is given by S yes, which is equal to load divided by the original area. The strain used for the engineering stress strain curve is the average linear strain. So, if you recall, when we introduced the uh, stress strain in the elasticity, there also I used the same terminology average strain, right? Average strain and average stress. So, you know, you have to now see that we are now talking about a bulk property. So, you have to connect what is the a strict definition of uh, a strain and the stress. But we are, here we are talking about average stress and average strain, which is obtained by dividing the elongation of gauge length of the specimen, which is delta by its original length. So, E is equal to delta by L naught, which is equal to delta L by L, which is equal to L minus L naught by L naught. Since both the stress and the strain are obtained by dividing the load and elongation by constant factors, the load elongation curve will have same shape as the engineering stress strain curve. So, this is uh, so what is shown here is uh, another interesting idea you have to keep in mind. There is something called you know the recoverable elastic strain. We have to understand what is this recoverable elastic strain. So, look at this diagram little carefully. Now, this is a load versus elongation plot. First, the specimen is loaded from 0 a and then it is unloaded. It just crosses the yield point and then got unloaded to the point a dash. Then what happens? So, corresponding to this point a, the strain is somewhere supposed to be here, but what is that we are landing? We are landing at a 1. So, this o a dash is the permanent strain, but a dash to this point that is B, it measures as a B is a recoverable elastic strain on unloading, which is B is measured as sigma 1 by E, which is nothing but P1 by A naught divided by E. So, this is recoverable. Okay. The permanent plastic deformation is offset A. This is offset A, which is shown in the figure. So, the A is permanent deformation. Plastic deformation B is the recoverable elastic strain. So, what is uh, what is important here? Point. Point is note that elastic deformation is always present in the tension specimen when it is under load. Okay. If the specimen were loaded and unloaded along the path O A B B dash, so O A B B dash. So, we are going further away okay, with the higher loads. Okay. The elastic strain would be greater than on loading to P1 
since P2 is greater than P1, but the elastic deformation D would be less than the plastic deformation C. Very, very important. So, now we are now crossing this point A continuously going all the way up to B and unloading and reaches point B dash. Then you just compare what is uh, the elastic strain would be greater than on loading to P1. So, elastic strain will be greater, okay, but the elastic deformation D is much less than the plastic deformation C. So, you see earlier the difference is not much A, B, but as you go higher loads, the D becomes the elastic recoverable strain. Elastic strain is much smaller as compared to the plastic deformation. So, this point we have to keep in mind. We will see how uh, all this small, small subtle differences will help us in understanding uh, material behavior, especially when we go to different type of loading, combinations of loading, right? Cyclic loading. All these uh, small, small factors will contribute in understanding. Okay.